Okay, uh, welcome to uh, the second session. Um, I'm David Shore, uh, your friendly moderator. Uh, and so we're going to have a paper, uh, first of all, uh, from uh, Benjamin Strauman, who's the uh, Alberico Gentili Fellow at NYU Law, um, and has done a lot of work uh, on Gentili himself, including publishing um, a critical edition of his Wars of the Romans, and also written on Roman Foundations of the Law of Nations, another book of his, and um, as well as several other publications uh, on early modern and, and Roman uh, law connections to international law. Uh, and then I'll introduce our commentator, and also uh, continuing with the dialogue in this conference between uh, early modernists and classicists um, and international lawyers. So uh, Uri Yiftach Franco is senior lecturer in classics at uh, Hebrew University. Um, and he specializes in Greek and Roman law, uh, legal history. Um, so, without further ado, how many? How many? 20, 20 okay. to 25 minutes. Okay. You said 25, I think. <laughs> I heard it, yeah. <laughs> it's not on record, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for having me and for uh, putting this together. I appreciate it. Um, there are two aspects of uh, Professor Benvenisti's stimulating paper that I thought could be fleshed out when approached with a historical perspective. The first aspect is that of sovereignty as a fiduciary relationship between the sovereign as fiduciary and the people as beneficiary. One of the most important strands of political thought where the relationship between the sovereign and the people is discussed is a Roman tradition dealing with the so-called lex regia or royal statute. The Lex Regia is a law that is discussed in the Roman Law Digest, where it's suggested that the Roman Emperor's rule and power derived somehow from the people. The precise nature of this derivation was discussed ever since the Roman law texts were rediscovered in medieval Italy. Was the Emperor's power revocable by the people, that is to say, was it a mere concession by the people? Or should the transfer be understood as having been an irre irrevocable alienation? Is this an absolute conception of the sovereignty of the emperor, or does it base the emperor's authority in the last resort on the sovereignty of the people? It's clear that historically or genealogically speaking, the emperor's sovereignty was derived from that of the people, but do the people retain some of that, of that authority, of their authority? And if not, is the emperor bound by previous and by his own legislation? There is a distinct ambiguity in the corpus juris, the codification of Roman law. The second century Juris Julian gives the people and their will a voice in legislation in that he sees the popular will at work in, making, in the making of custom and in, in that he gives custom the power to abrogate legislation. Statute may be repealed, quote, by the silent agreement of everyone expressed through desuetude, unquote. And the classic statements in the digest which have been taken to underwrite an absolute co conception of the emperor's sovereignty that, quote, what has pleased the emperor has the force of law and that he is not bound by the laws, legibus solutus, unquote. These statements are counterbalanced by what follows immediately after the um, earlier statement. I quote, this is because the people commits to him and into him its own entire authority and power, doing this by the royal law, the lex regia, which is passed pertaining to his, the emperor's authority. The emperor's sovereignty may thus not be bound by any statute, but his authority is seen ultimately to rest on the people's authority, which on this view must have also been, the people must have also been freed from the laws. They must have also been legibus salutus. The historian Otto von Gierke concisely summed up the two main strands of interpretation. One school explained this as a definitive, so I quote Gierke now on, this, on the, the ways the Lex Regio has been interpreted in the history of political thought. One school explained this as a definitive and irrevocable alienation of power, the other as a mere concession of its use and exercise. The dispute was generalized and led to the most widely different theories of the relation between ruler and people. On the one hand, from the people's perspective, from, from the people's abdication, the most absolute sovereignty of the prince might be deduced. On the other hand, the assumption of a mere concessio imperii, of a mere concession, led to the doctrine of popular sovereignty." End of quote. As I tried to sketch in the paper, the Lex Regia was at times interpreted with the Roman private law language of mandate in order to arrive at an interpretation that emphasized the limits on sovereignty and could be characterized as some sort of constitutional republicanism. 
This reasoning with private law concepts such as mandate was often supplemented with ideas from Roman public law, such as discussions as to when it was legitimate to delegate the general powers of jurisdiction and when it was not. In the paper, I discuss a work by the humanist lawyer Mario Salamonio from the early 16th century, where Salamonio discusses the Lex Regia, interpreting it as a contract of mandate, as a mandatum between people and emperor. Of course, the question arises as to the status of the Roman law of contract. Why should the rules of mandate be privileged? Why should these precise private law rules be binding on the emperor? Salomonio's answer seems to have been that at least certain Roman law rules have the status of natural law. And it seems that this, at least in part, would be Professor Benvenisti's answer as to the status of his own fiduciary device, trusteeship, as well, and as to why trusteeship should be in a position to encumber sovereigns with duties vis-a-vis -vis all of humankind. Uh, the other part of, of the answer um, I uh, provides is, is, of course, is, it, it's supplied by what... what, what uh, what he argues uh, is already implicitly contained in the international law concept of sovereignty, if I understand you correctly. However this may be, the whole Roman tradition of constraints on sovereignty does not yield anything in the way of sovereignty coming with fiduciary duties towards mankind at large. The beneficiary in these discussions is always the Roman people or, by analogy, the people of the emerging territorial states of early modern Europe. There is thus nothing in this strand of thinking that speaks to the second aspect of Professor Benvenisti's paper, that of a trusteeship exercised for the benefit of all of humanity. There are, however, other historical predecessors for the second aspect, such as Hugo Grotius's concept of humanitarian intervention, as discussed by Professor Criddle in his paper. In my paper, I discuss more broadly how Grotius thought legal obligations could arise from a universal human nature in the first place, how they could arise from from this shared human nature in the first place, and then try to exemplify some of these obligations in the context of Grotius's thought on the right of resistance, where private law language and the, and the idea of fiduciary duties also figure quite prominently. Another aspect of Grotius's thought, which I thought was important for Ayal ben Benvenisti's project, lies in the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties of justice or of international law. Today I should like to leave out most of these things and simply offer some brief observations on Grotius's right of resistance conceived along the lines of the sovereign as a fiduciary or usufructuary, and then give a view of Grotius on the acquisition of property and sovereignty. By way of conclusion, I'll say something as to, uh, as to how Emile de Wattel's great synthesis of the law of nature as applied to sovereign states could be seen as the most promising predecessor of Professor Benvenisti's project. So first, uh, Grotius on the right of resistance. He, Grotius, that is, conceded the right of resistance in the case of a ruler who had gained his authority by election or heredity and then alienated his power. Such a ruler enjoyed sovereignty only by usufruct, he's a usufructuarius, and it was therefore not transferable. A ruler who, in opposition to the provisions of the Roman law and usufructus, transferred his power could thus be lawfully resisted, according to Grotius. In this context, the right to resistance apparently did not arise primarily from a breach of contract by the ruler. There was instead a violation of the norms of Roman property law and usufruct, which in Grotius' view formed the basis for certain forms of political power and were probably conceived of as natural law norms that must precede any sovereign contract. Roman property norms are thus elevated to the status of constitutional rules. An analogous status is granted to Roman contract law. Grotius conceded the right of resistance in the case of a free people that had explicitly agreed upon such a right, such a right of resistance in their social contract. The status enjoyed by the Roman Popular Assembly in Grotius' examples is noteworthy. Like Jean Baudin, before him, Grotius interpreted the Roman Republic as a democracy. He saw in the election of magistrates by the Comitia, by the, by the Popular Assemblies, and, and in the right of appeal, the jus provocationis, the criteria for the maintenance of the republican order. The circumvention of these central institutions by a tyrant, for example, was for Grotius a just cause of war, which gave every citizen of such a free republic a right to resistance under the positive laws of their polity. According to Grotius, therefore, the natural right of resistance was, re was revived in cases of breach of contract or violation of natural law norms by a ruler. The latter existed when someone usurped authority through an unjust war. 
Failure to observe the norms of usus fructus on the part of princes, which could give cause for lawful resistance, represented such a violation of natural law. The case of breach of contract was a special case of natural rights, which Grotius is considered to result from contractual obligations. While violations of natural law were seen as analogous to violations of Roman property law, in which usurpation was viewed as unlawful expropriation of others' property, or as violation of the provisions for usufruct. Grotius, analyzing constitutional arrangements in Roman law terms, is not willing to make any substantive normative commitment to a particular kind of constitutional setup. He cannot be described as an author in the civic tradition of republicanism in this regard, let alone as a proponent of exclusive republicanism. What he does put forward, as Daniel Lee has lucidly observed, is a view according to which a people may remain free even while under the government of a prince. End of quote. This is so because if the prince holds sovereignty by usufruct, this will be perfectly compatible with po popular liberty. Surely, as Lee has it, the, a significant departure from one of the long-standing assumptions of early modern republicanism that popular liberty requires popular government. End of quote. It also follows that, as in the case of Professor Benvenisti's trusteeship, it follows that certain private, private law rules seem, if only by way of analogy, to become hierarchically superior to other lawmaking, and they become thus immune to sovereign power and to legislation as uh, flowing from sovereign power. In Grotius's case, this is because they, en they enjoy the protection of natural law rules. In the paper, I go on to discuss the history of the distinction between perfect and imperfect rights and duties of justice, and the impact, impact this distinction had on Votel, the Scottish Enlightenment, and not least on Professor Benvenisti's paper, if I understand uh, it correctly. I'll leave these aspects out for now in order to focus briefly on Grotius's views on the acquisition of property and sovereignty. The process of original acquisition, occupatio, of entire countries was, according to Grotius, not fundamentally different from the acquisition of private property by individuals. In this, he followed Cicero in the, um, in the, in the passage that was, was quoted earlier, um, it's 121. Um, as with private law acquisition in the state of nature, the occupation of the territory of a state leads to possession and ultimately to private property or to sovereignty over a public area, provided it had been in the possession of no one, it, provided it had been res nullius. The high seas could never qualify as res nullius in this, in this relevant sense because they could not be occupied. So there is a, there is a, um, that, that might, might be an additional aspect to consider it, um, to, be con to, to be considered um, for Daniel's uh, theme that the, the argument Grotius makes about the CS res communis, it's not least, it's of course uh, anchored, firmly anchored in Roman law, that it's a, it's a particular thing, so it's not amenable to being occupied. That is so for empirical reasons because it's simply too vast. But it's also not a scarce resource. It's also just there's lots of it. And of course, that's one of the reasons um, he distinguishes from stuff that is, that is indeed scarce. In Grotius's view, as the institution of property was thus invented, the law enshrining the institution was established in order to imitate nature. Thus, even though it does not exist by nature, property is nevertheless a pre-political institution of the state of nature. As Professor Benvenisti notes in his paper, Grotius referred to the famous theater analogy, which probably came originally from the Greek Stoic Chrysippus, but which Grotius took from Seneca's De Beneficiis. I quote Grotius, um, alluding to Seneca, um, he says, the equestrian rows of seats belong to all the Roman knights in the theater. Yet the place that I have occupied, occupavi, in those rows becomes my own, becomes his proprios. Grotius here conveniently leaves out the context of Seneca's passage where common rather than private property is at issue. This is instructive. Seneca's concern is with temporary use of one theater seat exclusively for viewing the spectacle while the seat remains in common property. As Philip Mitzis reminds us, quote, Seneca's point is about the use of commonly shared property in a system of mutual f benefit, something that the theater analogy neatly captures by explaining the kind of coordination of interests and the range of virtuous attitudes necessary for those who hold property in common. End of quote. 
So while it is hard to see how Chrysippus, indeed any of the earlier Greek Stoics, could have used the example for anything but for justifying and explaining the communal use of property, it's perfectly obvious that for Grotius, no less than for Cicero, the point was to explain the genealogy of private property in the state of nature while at the same time justifying its existence and arguing for its protection under natural law. Incidentally, it seems to me that Professor Benvenisti here should reference Chrysippus and the Greek Stoics rather than Cicero and Grotius. Grotius' use of the language of occupatio, which bestows in, under Roman law instant exclusive ownership over Reis and Elias under Roman law, um, this, the, the use of the language of occupatio shows how partial Grotius is to its, pro, to its protection. And I think that even in the cases of necessity, he discusses, in, in those cases he discusses of, of extreme necessity, private property or sovereignty are not really loosened, let alone given up. It's not quite right to say that, I quote from, from Ayol's paper, that ownership must be limited to extreme necessity. I would say rather extreme necessity may allow for use rights by the suffering non-owner without, however, changing existing property relations, according to Grotius. Granting such use rights merely allays the hardship of private property, the regal domini. In the case of equal need, the possessor should always win out, according to Grotius. So there we have this um, hypothetical of two people reaching for a plank, and they're both uh, obviously um, they both need the plank, and Grotius is thinking about how to um, come up with a, with a legal rule, uh, although it's hard, as many others were afterwards were quick to point out, it's hard to imagine any sanction for misbehavior in this uh, uh, situation that would, that would be worse than what uh, the person is about to suffer anyways, the loser of the fight, that is to say. In his later work, as in the earlier De Jure Praedae, Grotius accepted Cicero's criterion under which acquisition of property was legal. But he had added an additional element to this account in his later work, De Jure Velio Pacis, which proved to be extraordinarily influential, the element of mutual agreement. So now acquisition is, was viewed simultaneously as tacit contractual agreement, a pactum tacitum, which ex expressed agreement to the introduction of private property and its attendant special rights. The rule of natural law under which property could be obtained through acquisition was supplemented with everyone's hypothetical tacit agreement to the principle of acquisition. To the natural law criterion of the justice of the original acquisition of property already, which can already be found in Grotius' early texts, Grotius now added the element of tacit agreement. Um, so, by way of conclusion, I would say that Professor Benvenisti's aim to attribute a more taxing set of duties on sovereigns may require, as he himself points out in the paper, um, more sovereignty rather than less, or at least a recognition of sovereignty's crucial role in the model of sovereignty as tr trusteeship. Crucial role are the or AL's words. For sovereigns to be able to discharge these further reaching duties and to assume a certain amount of accountability vis-a-vis -vis the principle, and this is a principle Cicero, Seneca and Grotius would, would all have called the society of mankind, these sovereigns' own agency may stand in need, paradoxically, of a certain amount of Hobbesian strengthening. Misgivings about sovereigns relying on principles of a shared human nature as mere pretext for expansion and domination have already been voiced by Vatel who argued against Grotius' doctrine of humanitarian intervention in a chapter titled The Common Duties of a Nation Towards Others or of the Offices of Humanity Between Nations. Vatel wrote that, quote, it is strange to hear the learned and judicious Grotius assert that a sovereign may justly take up arms to chastise nations which are guilty of enormous transgressions of the law of nature. Could it escape Grotius that notwithstanding all the precautions added by him in the following paragraphs, his opinion opens a door to all the ravages of enthusiasm and fanaticism and furnishes ambition with numberless pretexts." End of quote. Grotius himself had been perfectly aware of this line of argument and pointed out that, quote, ancient and modern history in, indeed informs us that avarice and ambition do frequently lay hold on, to, or lay hold on such excuses, but the use that wicked men make of a thing does not always hinder it from being just in itself. Pirates, too, sail on the seas, and thieves wear swords as well as others." End of quote. The same argument could be made against those who point to the susceptibility of Vatel's own arguments to being put to imperialist uses. 
Bartel would indeed seem to be the most fruitful predecessor to Professor Benveniste's sovereignty as trusteeship. In Vartel's vein, one can plausibly attribute imperfect duties to sovereigns, relying on a concept of international commercial society arising out of the mutual assistance required by the natural society of mankind. This is what Professor Benvenisti seems to have in mind when he alludes to Christian Wolff's conception of imperfect obligations. But maybe it's not what you had in mind, as we, we just <laughs> um, found out. And it's clear that something like Vittoria's first just title uh, the duty to allow trade, the first just title for the conquest um, of the Americas, and the, the title of communication, the duty to allow trade, that this would be too perfect a duty to be accepted. But the idea of an imperfect duty of mutual assistance realized through commerce in conjunction with a robust duty to loosen sovereignty's grip on natural resources in the face of scarcity does have a distinctly Vatelian flavor to it. For Wolf and Kant, occupation bro very broadly understood that is to say, not, not just effective occupation. So broad occupation was sufficient for claims of sovereignty. For Vatel, effective occupation and use were needed to establish exclusive sovereign claims. And for Benvenisti, the cosmopolitan purpose of Vatel's concept of sovereignty is further strengthened by what he calls deliberative obligations. Sovereigns who are trustees of humanity do seem modeled in broad analogy with Vatel's moral obligation to use natural resources efficiently. But at the same time, there's an understandable reluctance to press the analogy too hard because the, the specter of the justification of colonialism looms. However, as Bella Coposi and Richard Wachmore in their introduction to Vatel's uh, treatise and correctly point out for Vatel, quote, the perfect, the perfect right of preservation of a potential donor nation was bound to clash with the equally perfect right of preservation of a state on the brink of starvation. It is in this context that one needs to read Vatel's often cited justification of the appro appropriation of uncultivated land by European settlers in America, end of quote. There is, in other words, a real conflict that cannot simply be assumed away by referring to the potentially dangerous ends Vattel's reasoning may serve. Vattel's principle may still contain some normative pool. In addition to these moral considerations, enlightened self-interest and prudence in the form of self-serving utility calculations as recommended to sovereigns by Vattel may complement and additionally strengthen the concept of sovereignty as trusteeship in a useful way. As Isaac Nokimovsky in an elucidating article reminds us, quote, Vattel sought to formalize the notion of an enlightened self-interest which held that justice was the best policy. This entailed defining the role of commerce in the state in order to impose boundaries on appeals to reason of state with respect to trade and amounted to a theory of obligation that was based on utility and enlightened self-interest. Sovereigns, even if conceived merely as mandatories of their own peoples in the vein of Salamonio and other interpreters of the Roman Lex Regia, may thus be convinced under Vatelian premises that they, are well, that they are well advised to give some consideration to interstate externalities in the global condominium and to non-citizens and people beyond their borders as well. Thank you. <laughs>